one thing I've always said is that my career comes first and then um, autism is second. And for a long time, I had a title slide show a picture of me uh, teaching in the classroom. Autism is a really important part of who I am, but it's secondary to career things that I have done, such as being a college professor, uh, designing equipment, just all kinds of, uh, of career stuff. Because one of the things that's given my life meaning is having, a, having an interesting career, but also a career that actually helps to make things better, whether it's for animals or whether it's for people with autism. Right. And, and everybody needs to have that kind of meaning in their life. You know, it, I think about when parents are, for instance, introducing their child on the spectrum to a new person. And sometimes they're a little nervous about the behavior of the child or the way the child comes across. And they kind of lead with, well, hi, here's George, he's autistic. What do you think about that? Well, I think it might be better to come out and say, well, you know, that, that this child likes art or math or music or uh, talented in, in some area, you know, present something positive first. I actually learned that in my speaking. I had something really controversial to, to um, talk about in the cattle industry. I learned very early on, don't do it first. <laughs> no, present the positive stuff first. It's something yeah. I learned. Well, I right. the same thing with um, you know presenting the kid you know let's present the you know the actual truthful positives that the child has right because the child has their own specific interests they have their own specific you know activities that are going on and autism's not all of who they are well that's the problem and i'm seeing too many kids where autism is becoming their total life because i've had many grandparents come up to me and good careers, and they discover they're on the autism spectrum when the kids get diagnosed. And where a, a label can really be helpful is uh, helping people with relationships. That's really later on in life. The relationships are a mess. And then they find out they're on the autism spectrum. It's almost a relief. They're happy Right, it about explains it. things. But that, but the other end of the sword is not so positive. And I'm saying two uh, many kids are uh, getting so hung up on their autism that they aren't learning working skills. I'm right. seeing them getting too babied and coddled by the families and they aren't learning basic life skills like shopping or handling money. Just some of the most um, uh, basic things. They get yeah. so hung up on the autism. Yeah. It's great to have the labels. It's great to have more awareness and people understand a little bit more these days, but we're awfully quick to label as well. And once you label something, it kind of sticks with you. Well, that's the problem. But the other problem we got is that to get services, you have to have a label. Because right. That's the problem. You know, just get a little help and extra help in reading or something. It isn't my generation was a little bit of help in reading. You know, now you got to have a dyslexia diagnosis or something like that, or you're not going to get any help in reading. Yeah. And, so we and can have the diagnosis. We need the diagnosis to get the resources. But what we have to remember is that that doesn't define the entire child. And sometimes, especially professionals, really need to remember that. And remember, like if you're a teacher and you have an autistic child in your classroom, that try not to overfocus on that and remember what's the child's personality? What kind of traits do they have? What do they like? And if you need to explain that child to the rest of the um, classroom a little bit so they understand, that's fine. You can do that. But to continue to just see him primarily as the kid that he is. Well, you see, this this is the problem. And I'm, I'm, I'm one other thing, I've talked a lot about the different kinds of minds. The visual thinkers like me, the more mathematical thinkers, and the word thinkers. Now, the word thinkers, I think, have the biggest problem with getting locked into the label uh, because there's a tendency in verbal thinking to overgeneralize. You see, to me, it's totally ridiculous that you put the autism label on Elon Musk right. uh, or Einstein or something like that. And then at the other end, you've got somebody who can't dress themselves with uncontrollable epilepsy. And it's all called the same thing. You see, as a right. visual thinker, these different kids would you know, look very, very different. And they also need very different services. 
Yeah. So we okay. talked about that in the book a little bit in terms of the different kinds of thinkers and, and how to approach them. And also we talked about all the other things that impact on a child. We've got a whole chapter on psychological factors. We've got an entirely separate chapter. We'll talk about it in another YouTube on medical um, challenges that the child may have. And we've got a whole chapter on the learning zone and how you keep a child in there so that they can really be stretched and, and learn. Um, but all of it is about bringing out potential. All of it is recognizing the autism, being realistic about it, but also knowing that there's a fascinating multifaceted kid in there who can probably do more than a lot of the professionals might be telling the parents. Exactly. I see that all the time, even more severely impacted kids. They go, well, he'll never walk. He'll never dress himself. Now he's not going to go to college, but they find out he does want to walk and he is able to dress himself. There's oftentimes a tendency to underestimate. And what you got to do is gradually stretch. My ability in art was always encouraged, and I was encouraged to do lots of different kinds of art and not just do the same horse head over and over again. Another kid might be good at math, and he needs to be moved ahead or she needs to be moved ahead in math. And I just heard something really awful at an educational conference I was at just recently, is uh, one of the, the teachers came up to me, a regular ed teacher, and said their, their school stopped having a library. They would oh just have libraries in each classroom. I think that's a gigantic mistake because that's going to make it a lot harder for maybe a bright kid to look at books in the next grade. And I think that's just terrible. And I was a bad student, but I spent a lot of time in the library and I read a lot of stuff in the library. And Elon Musk um, read all kinds of stuff in the library. Right. He right. also was allowed to do it at the local bookstore without buying books. Sometimes they kicked him out. But <laughs> I think um, some people realized, you know, how important that was that he was allowed to read those books. Well, you know, when you close off, off a the library, library to a child, you close off a world of possibility. Well, I That's think how it, a lot of kids learn about new things. Well, uh, this was an elementary school teacher I talked to very recently and their school had stopped having a general library. And I think that's just awful. Yeah, you know, I it agree. Was, it was funding, the reason they did that, because it took two staff people to run the library. You know, one of the things we talk about in the book too is how to come up with creative ways to help your child that don't cost a lot of money. Well, because not everybody has money to spend on expensive programs and, and so forth. And there's a lot of simple ideas out there. Well, that's the reason why it came out with books like the, um, like the Outdoor Scientist, one of my books that came out with this. It's a yep. lot of fun activities that kids can do that don't cost a lot of money. And it's the same thing with right. Calling All Minds. Right. Or, uh, my little aviation experiments. And these are all things that kids can do that don't cost money. And I'm finding that today, you've got kids growing up today, um, I've had them in my class who have never used a ruler, never used a ruler to measure anything. Right. That's 2021. Right. That's you know, we have an example in the book from an occupational therapist uh, during COVID. She owns a clinic and they had to shut down and they couldn't even do home visits at the time and so she has all this equipment this you know expensive some of it equipment in the clinic and she didn't have access to any of that so she found a park where there weren't very many kids and they could social distance and she used very simple things like the sliding board like the mulch for texture um, they made things so she was very creative and I think sometimes we just kind of forget oh, if we can't avail ourselves of this resource, then Johnny gets nothing. And it doesn't have to be that way. That could have been a next door neighbor taking the child to the park too. And sure, they may not have had all the skills, but Johnny would have got more than nothing. And that, that's, that's something. Well, when I was a kid, if you could make it out of cardboard, I, it got made. Right. I mean, there's a lot of materials like that 
that are readily available. The amount of cardboard that's worked is just phenomenal. And um, that's the kind of stuff that when we were kids, we made things out. Yeah. And that teaches so many skills. It teaches thinking skills. It also teaches body awareness skills and sensory skills. Yeah. There's a lot of things you can do, uh, you know, that just, that aren't expensive. And, you know, when I was a child, it was go outside and play and we would just make up our own games. And, and um, I watched a little kid the other day. Um, there was water coming off the roof of our building over at the university and it came down a little concrete gutter and then went under a metal plate under the sidewalk. This kid had the greatest time unclogging the leaves from the, the little concrete sluice and then watching the water come out the other side. And that's the kind of stuff we did. It was clean water, it was off the roof, it wasn't something dirty. But that's just something, most mundane thing, a little roof gutter on our building. And right. dad was facilitating it. And the kid was absolutely fascinated. Yeah. And he was also learning how water flows. Right, he's losing ca um, learning cause and effect, and That's and right. he took for the someone on the down. spectrum that would be great sensory. Um, and well, he had to go in there and pull the leaves out, and then he'd run over to the other side as the metal plate that was on the sidewalk, and and watch for the water to come out the other side. And he was having an absolute fab fabulous time with something that cost absolutely nothing. Yeah, that's a great example of it. Yeah. Well. Again, to summarize, our first chapter, our first mindset in navigating autism is helping professionals and teachers and parents get beyond the label, the necessary label, and get beyond it and see the child uh, as potential and focus on strengths. And we give lots of examples of how to do that and lots of examples of what to watch out for. Well, I also get a lot of questions about uh, how do you figure out what kind of thinker a kid is. It often doesn't show up in a three-year-old. You're more likely to see at six, seven, and eight, my kind of minds are going to be good at art. Also love to build things. And then the more mathematical kids, um, they love to build things and don't bore them with the baby math. These are the kids where they need to be moved ahead in math. And then the word thinkers are good with words and you want to broaden. So if the kid has an interest in cars, we can teach reading with cards. We can draw pictures of cards. Now, sometimes there's a confusion between a, a skill and an interest. Okay, a car or a boat or a dog, something like that. That's an interest where the types of thinking, a visual thinker like me, an object visualizer, the visual spatial mathematical mind or the word thinker, the verbal thinker, those are different types of thinking. So when I really talk about developing strengths, I'm talking more about um, if it's my kind of mind using art. Um, well, I could draw pictures of dogs. Well, horses is one of my big things. A mathematical kid, you move them ahead in math. Both the uh, visual mind and the math mind like to build things. And a lot of kids today, they just don't have stuff to build things out of. And uh, right. I went to a maker fair, um, I don't know, five or six years ago, and there was a lot of electronic stuff there. You know what the biggest hit there was? Large washing machine boxes. And they had taken hacksaw blades and had taped one end to make a handle that makes a little safe saw. It's even safe for little kids to use to cut that real heavy cardboard. And they were having a wonderful time with something they got free from the appliance store. <laughs> That's a great example. Well, thanks for watching, folks. We'll be back and talk about mindset number two, which has to do with a whole child evaluation. See you soon. Bye-bye.